Hello, thank you for tuning in on this great streaming format that Spark has teed up. I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people, the traditional custodians of the land. I'm here uh, right now in the Darlington campus of the University of Sydney, where it seems like everything is in bloom. I'm Rupal Isman, the director of the Sydney Knowledge Hub at the University of Sydney. Over the next few hours of Spark programming, you'll be hearing from researchers who came up with an invention and decided to bring that in the who really want it. The nature of academia tends to favor working with researchers, um, work, tends to favor researchers working with other researchers. It could seem like a lonely place for those who want to get their work beyond the campus. But the next few hours are meant to inspire researchers to think about the potential real world application for their work by hearing from those who are doing it now. I've been at the university for just over a year and I'm amazed to see how see up close how universities can be a breeding ground for the most innovative solutions to real world problems. When I first started this role, I was told lead with intention and vision and be clear on what you want to achieve and you can achieve anything on campus. And while it may not always be easy to navigate, universities have an abundance of resources to help incubate these ideas. The topic of research commercialization is a really big and really important one. We can talk about the impact that universities can have on the diverse length of Australia's economy, which of course is topical right now, but I'd rather get out of the macro. Today, we're gonna to focus on the impact on individual researchers and in the areas that they care most about. I'd like to thank Jackie Randalls at Inspiring Australia, who always has tremendous energy when it comes to spreading the gospel on research to impact. And I want to give a huge shout out to our community manager, Sarah Lacroix, for being the driving force behind this session and also the leading, leading the charge for the next few hours of programming. Virtual events don't have the satisfaction or the acknowledgement that in-person events can often have. So I'm particularly grateful in this environment. Thank you, Sarah. Right now, we're here to talk, we're here to say that crazy works, startups have more impact than papers. We are lucky to have Ram Bouvere, business strategy manager at UNSW and host of the wonderful podcast, Research for What? If you haven't heard it, um, I, I really encourage you to take a listen, to lead a conversation with entrepreneurs representing three universities with a venture capitalist that focus on startups coming out of the university. Ram, over to you to introduce the panel. Thank you very much, Rupon. Uh, I hope everyone can, can hear me quite, quite clearly. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I'm very excited to hear crazy, amazing, good stories today. So stay with us until, until the end. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome everyone at, the, at this Spark Festival event called Crazy Works and Startups Have More Impact Than Papers. This is a slightly provocative you know, title that I think um, mo a lot of you will relate to. Um, today we have five awesome, a little bit crazy panelists uh, who are working in research, have done research, and have at some stage also founded a startup to commercialize their research. You're going to hear three amazing, a little bit crazy stories. The first panelist is on my left here on your screen, is Tony Wies. Tony is professor of biochemistry at the University of Sydney. He's also the team leader in the tissue engineering and regenerative medicine team at the Charles Perkins Center at um, the University of Sydney. In 2008, he founded Elastigen and sold the company to Allegan in 2018 for $120 million. We also have Debbie Sanders. Debbie is a conservation ecologist, postdoc at the Australian National University. And in 2016, she founded and became the CEO of Wildlife Drones a startup that commercializes animal tracking systems. Finally, we have Mariam, Mariam Parvis. Mariam has also a very strong scientific background, uh, studied at the University of New South Wales in Sydney and then at the University of Technology in Sydney. And in 2018, she founded a startup called SDIP Innovations, which she has now taken to an incubator in San Francisco. So thanks for, for joining us also, Mariam, from, from there. And we have uh, Rupal, you have heard um, Rupal, she is the manager or the director of the co-working space, the Sydney Knowledge Hub. Um, and we'll hear from her, we we'll go back to her to hear how she can help and how, where and how can you find help to create a startup. 
And we also have Natasha Rawlings. She's in the investment manager for at Uniseed. Um, Natasha has a very candid and open uh, attitude to startups, and she's here to help uh, any potential founders, researchers out there. So let's get started. Um, maybe with, with you, Tony, can I ask you, you've been um, managing both a very successful academic research career and a startup for over 10 years. Um, did you feel crazy at times, and why did you try to do both? Well, uh, thanks for the opportunity to be here. Um, First up, uh, I agree, it is crazy to do both. <laughs> um, I th thoroughly enjoy the journey. Um, I um, really want to emphasize, of course, it's not me alone. I'm surrounded uh, and have been surrounded by remarkable people, which has both made the journey more invigorating as well as more fulfilling. For example, a remarkable CEO at Elastigen, a remarkable team, um, which is the company that I'd founded. Um, I think it's all very manageable. You just do a bit less sleep, you know, and um, and I just love the idea of being able to get um, uh, ticks in the boxes in both categories. A very fulfilling journey. So what, can I ask you, why did you try and do both? Why, um, and we'll hear from maybe Mariam later, why did you feel that you had to do both at the same time? Well, yes. Yeah, so uh, I guess I wear two different hats. I don't know if that can actually both fit, but, uh, but either way, though, uh, uh, one hat, of course, as we've already discussed today, is the academic hat. So I want to make sure that I continue to succeed in that area. And um, as you and many of our colleagues listening today know, that has gone very well. Um, but in addition to that, I really feel strongly that it's important to give back to society. And, um, and one of the mechanisms by which we can do that is to generate a company uh, or companies uh, and uh, generate lots of intellectual property. Uh, for example, I now have uh, over 100 awarded patents in over 20 patent families to my name as an inventor. So, you know, giving back to society has been very important to me. And hey, the ride is pretty crazy, hey? Right. Um, so maybe let's hear from Mayim now. Mayim, you, your approach was quite different, and I think you're crazy in a quite, quite a different way. You decided to leave academia and to focus entirely on a startup. Can you explain to us why you did that and um, how you did it? Yeah, I, I believe that, yeah, there is no uh, unique prescription for everyone. And uh, I was in my early career compared to the, like Tony, you have established group, you have the opportunity to create more intellectual properties and go and create maybe multiple companies but for me we definitely needed uh so each company definitely after a while of uh like investigation you need full-time people and uh tony had like those resources to have full-time people actually focus on the company that he founded and uh for us uh we were the ones uh, the founders were the ones that decided to be the full-time people uh, who takes the earliest stage um, risks, basically. And yes, this, this is uh, definitely a crazy and it's uh, not uh, being stable, especially like when you have finished your PhD or at the stage of your life that you want to finally <laughs> become stable, but then uh, out of sudden you make this decision. So it's crazy, definitely. Uh, but uh, I think as Tony said, it's all about enjoying and making sure that you can give it back to society. If you can give it back by staying in academia, that's the way. If you don't have that option and you need, you need to be that full-time person on the company, then that's a decision to be made. But definitely it took me one year. So over one year I had my position, but at the same time I was doing customer interviews. I was talking with big companies about the problem to make sure the problem actually exists. I was taking uh, courses uh, and trainings to make sure that I'm ready. Same with my co-founders. So I would say it's a, like a cord that you want to cut with universities. So for it's different, like when the baby is ready to be separated from that mom. So I think it's just really depends on the nature and the resources that you have and also the now know how, like how you can transfer it to another team or you are the one who should keep it and keep developing that for a while before you are able to like just fully uh, hand it over to your team. That makes sense. So, 
So I know you didn't just cut the cord with um, academia, you also took the baby overseas, uh, li literally as yeah. well. Uh, <laughs> wh why did you do that? Um, so <laughs> again, it's like a lot of sacrifice. So when I took my startup baby to overseas, I had to be away from my under two years <laughs> baby for four months. So uh, it's a decision that we made based on the support that we have at Oswell's Health. And our uh, first uh, juristic clearance will be through FDA uh, in the US. And also it's the place that we uh, could and we did found the serial entrepreneurs to become part of the team who exactly were active in the same section as us. So um, support from New South Wales Health uh, basically enabled us to be able in the place that is the biggest market, uh, the first market, uh, and also we have access to a team that have done it before, but we are quite an, uh, completely an Australian company and coming back with the team that we have developed and the learnings that we actually uh, just try to learn here. So that's like kind of uh, the development on the team on technical side and also on the personal side that we did through this journey with UTSF Rosenman and QB3 Incubator here. Thanks, Maya. Maybe we'll go back to um, where and what sort of support you can you, you can get along the way, um, especially early on. Um, I just want to ask Debbie. Um, Debbie, I have the feeling you are almost too still very successful, uh, almost too successful in both academia and your startup that you founded a few years ago. Um, where are you in that journey? Have you decided whether um, doing both is crazy or choosing one is crazy? I'm not sure we can hear. I can't there hear. You. You. Sorry, I had mute on. <laughs> um, I think. I think. To be honest, the craziest thing is to not try something. Um, I guess I haven't had these clear cut decision moments. Um, my academic career, uh, you know, I was applying for grants as you do. Um, we weren't getting them, even though we had some brilliant projects that are lined up. It's a very common scenario in academia that wasn't happening. Um, and yet my my research project, which developed the first radio tracking drone, um, was coming to an end. And then all of a sudden we got this influx of interest and people saying, I want one of these things. How can I get it? And I'm like, well, I've got no idea. I just built it for myself. <laughs> like I, I just had my own problem trying to track small migratory birds um, and wanted to find a way forward. And um, so there was no real, oh, you have to make this crazy choice. It was like, I have to make, I have to create opportunities because I wasn't being given any. I actually did explore through the university how we could translate this technology and I didn't get the support that I needed. And so I actually, um, like my young, actually went out and had to find, um, educate myself, find my own support. And I did it myself outside of the university. We had to completely build a different system because we'd learned a lot about what didn't work um, in that original prototype that was built. So for me, um, yes, I still have a, a sort of a foot in both camps, if you like. But like Tony, when it comes to reporting time and they all collide, um, the sleep goes out the window and you just kind of go, what am I doing? Like, but. <laughs> Um, for me, the, the project that I still have um, is a conservation project and it's actually implementing all of the research I did in my PhD in translating that into conservation protection at, on the ground, protecting habitat for endangered species. So for me, um, it's, it's worth the pain to just make sure that that project is entirely successful, as successful as possible. Um, and I do do that on a very, very part-time basis. Um, and as soon as the funding goes for that, I don't think I'm going to have a choice whether I remain in academia or not. It will just, my employment prospects at, a, at the university will disappear. And this is, you know, I'm an early career researcher as well. And you just get to a point where you're too expensive and PhD students are cheaper than you. And so you get pushed to the side. And so you need to find your own path because you won't get the support necessarily through universities. I know different universities have different setups, but my experience is that I got little to no support at the university as well as other issues as well. So for me to actually go off and find that there was an alternative 
was the only real choice that I had. I, I, um, I had young children as well. Um, and so I actually spent, although we founded the company in 2016, it was because we won a $10,000 grant and we needed to put it into a bank account. <laughs> and so we spent the next two years actually validating the market while I still had my little kids at home and I was only working part time. So it was very much just like, you know, prove the market, explore the customers, see if there is actually a need out there, whether people are willing to pay for a product, they have enough pain around it. So we spent a couple of years doing that before we actually got our first lot of investment and all of that time was unpaid. And so, yeah, quite, quite a different journey. And to me, the, yeah, the, the craziest thing is to, not explore new opportunities because um now yeah i i've gone from you know three volunteers working together to to having 13 staff so um now it's it's yeah it's pretty amazing very empowering and i've really loved it and and one thing that in terms of impact um for my research i have i'm having a really positive impact for a species but policy government policy is, is driving it to extinction regardless of what I do. So that's quite distressing. Um, and as a species I've worked on for a very long time. And, um, and now with my business, I actually get to contribute to really amazing projects globally um, and have a positive impact on many, many different species in many different countries um, and support people who are doing fantastic work. So it's, it's been really surprising. A lot of this I never even expected when I used to go out bird watching for my job that I would then own a tech company and manufacture stuff and distribute it across the world. I, I just never imagined that that would be the case. <laughs> it's interesting to hear what drove you three to creating a startup. Right. Um, Tony, can I ask you, um, is the reason you managed to do both um, be successful in your academic career and create a startup? was the reason that you had established yourself as an academic researcher already when you started your 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 company uh yeah so um like uh my other um highly talented colleagues on the panel here and let me say it's great to be on this remarkable panel uh quite privileged to be here with with all of you um so my my journey was never quite as straightforward. I've always taken the perspective that uh, you just ignore the no and you continue on with uh, whatever options are available. <laughs> I guess the analogy is if you can't get through the door, you go through the window, right? Um, no. um, so the career was was uh, definitely on track. Um, it, it was definitely uh, establishing. Um, but for example, there was a senior colleague, someone who was in a position of authority, who uh, sat me down one day and just gave me a smile and told me not to interact with industry anymore. Um, so, you know, I went home rather discouraged from that and then thought, well, I can either ignore that or, or do, uh, uh, you know, or listen to a classical academic path. And so I guess I would have to say that I've uh, benefited from being in an academic system, but I've never completely, utterly followed anyone's rules. I've tried to follow the rules <laughs> that I believe ethically and morally are right. You know? <laughs> well, and, and maybe the, the fact that RuPaul is here um, and the fact that uh, Sydney Uni established the Sydney um, Knowledge Hub is a, so, somehow a sign that universities are starting to realize that startups industry is not the dark side and we even offering um, you know support to our researchers um, what sort of people do you come do you see come through the hub and what support can you give them yeah I think that the the establishment of the Sydney knowledge hub and other initiatives like this are a convergence of a few different things. One is funding, um, you know, a few people and a lot of people I talk about, uh, talk to uh, researchers that I speak to talk about um, funding coming to an end. And so you need to diversify your funding pool. Um, the second is, I think, um, the, the pressure, the social pressure for um, universities to um, demonstrate their impact and whether that's, you know, external pressure. I think, you know, people are, um, whether they're researchers or otherwise, are looking to see um, how can I make, make the biggest impact on society through their work. 
Um, and the third is like startups are sexy. You know, the last kind of 10 years in Australia has been like just a, kind of a, the, the beginning of a golden age for, uh, for startups here, um, for, for tech based and digital startups. And so there's a lot more examples. And so I think that people are interested in kind of the, you know, in, 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 that, in that ride. Um, the sort of people that we have here, the Sydney Knowledge Hub is for two things. One is to support researchers on their commercialization journey. And the second is to help industry work more closely with the, the with researchers at the university. So like I mentioned earlier in my intro, um, navigating the university is really tough. Um, so, you know, through our co-working space, we have industry who use it as their primary workspace and we work with them to just kind of unpack some of their problems and see of the just abundance of resources you know, available. How can they kind of navigate? How can I make the introductions? Um, and through the commercialization pathway for, for researchers, you know, right now we don't have any programs or um, accelerators or anything that we do to put researchers through and that, that will change. I can, you know, guarantee you that will change. So right now our primary um, way of doing that is through um, exposure. So supporting events like these, making introductions for researchers to people like Natasha and um, other resources that are, uh, you know, in, in the wider startup world. Um, and so, you know, there's uh, like two things. One is kind of the impact change that the City Knowledge Hub is trying to, to, to make just kind of in terms of metrics and output. And the other is kind of the culture change that we're trying to um, help the university go through and working with um, in, in this journey. And I guess the last point that I want to make about this is that um, I guess commercialization and industry engagement, those are kind of uh, sometimes looked as two separate things. So how can industry fund um, research at the university? But they're kind of stemming from the same problem, which or same, um, I guess, insight, which is, you know, how do you learn more about the, the, the problem that you're trying to solve? How do researchers learn more about the, the, uh, the, the problem they're trying to solve? The more that researchers uh, come to networking events, learn about the outside world, get beyond the university, I think the more interest that they'll have with um, how their, their work can make it to the market, whether that's working with industry or commercializing their, their, their research. Okay, so, so two very important points for me here. Um, the first one is how to um, find a problem worth solving. And the second one is how to find the money to try and, you know, develop the, the solution. I'll come to the second, I'll come to Natasha to, to address the second point just now. But Mayam, can I ask you, when did you know, how did you identify a problem that you, when did you know it was worth solving? so much that you said you decided to to leave academia and you know take your family and your start a baby um, into a new world um like i mean talking about culture i think i i, I will answer your question but i think one thing that we definitely uh, need to work on in australia is that we need to um start having the trainings for even from bachelor students so they have this entrepreneurship mind when they come to their phd so it's like it's just automatically they can't think in that way so i think that training uh, scientists is very important part of that so um our project is actually uh, i did my phd in, at unsw but m m the project that we are taking trying to take to market is actually my co-founders uh, initial idea. So he developed this idea when he was collaborating with uh, Westmead Children's Hospital and uh, he describes it as he was observing a lot of children coming back just for remove metallic implant, just for upsize uh, vascular implants. And uh, he was talking with this uh, orthopedic surgeon who uh, is actually one of the very well respected orthopedic surgeons in uh, our community in Sydney and he was like you are a material engineer go and do something develop something that uh, we don't need to remove it like something like sutures like how they go away safely I'm not happy with the current uh, resorbable implants and I don't use them I used to use them until four years ago and then uh, my patients came back with inflammation infection uh, other problems like the implant was not actually going away after three years and some even after 13 years like just i think uh, our journey started uh, from there and then uh, when uh, both of us are graduates from medical device commercialization course at uh, which is sponsored by new south wales health uh, and uh, was uh, operated by and managed by cicada innovation by that time 
So uh, after, uh, for me, after my PhD, I took this course, which is specific for clinicians, postdocs, and academics to learn about commercialization of medical devices in particular. And I remember uh, I, I did it in 2017. And by that time, we were doing that actually next to elastogen. And they keep, they were keep talking about like torpolastine and uh, like how it's getting close to exit. And we had a material company and we couldn't find a lot of examples in australia like we don't see a lot of biomaterial startups actually so and back to four or five years ago even it was more rare so we were definitely inspired by uh, the journey uh, that elastogen takes uh, and also uh, we we were inspired by seeing a lot of um, people going back unnecessary to hospitals to remove implants definitely our solution cannot like remove all those uh, avoidable surgeries, but we're trying to just have the impact, remove uh, the need for uh, some of those unnecessary surgeries. But again, even after uh, like a lot of animal studies, uh, benchtop studies, it was all on the research side. So when we we were thinking about like maybe we should team up and try commercialize that, that was the time that we actually started talking to uh, a lot of surgeons, and that's very com out of comfort zone for a researcher. I think a lot of you will <laughs> admire that. So I remember like first time me going to the hospital trying to catch orthopedic surgeons and they were not even uh, like I wasn't I, I wasn't able to catch their attention. And after a while, I learned some tips like after a while, I was not saying I'm Marianne Parvis. I was saying I'm Dr. Marianne Parvis. And I was getting some like it's just small <laughs> tips that you learn and <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, also you learn that how you like pitch your idea, uh, you keep practicing how you pitch your idea in the way that you don't disclose more, but you talk about impact. And I, I was from I went from the time that I couldn't get one orthopedic surgeon talking to me to the time that I can actually right now text to 10, 20 of them and just ask them questions on or get them on the call. So I think it's just uh, trying to find the customers, uh, future customers. If you are developing a medical device, I think it should come out of university, honestly, because it takes a, a lot of, it takes a village and it takes a lot of scientific background to develop that. And then also you should think about having a physician or surgeon part of your team, because those are the ones that actually will use it. So just think ahead about who is going to use it, who is going to choose it. So basically, uh, choose their buyers and payers, think about that and start talking to them. It's, it's really hard at the beginning. I, it's, I, I cannot say how much it was hard for me. It's really hard. But after a while, uh, you learn and go to one and then you ask them if they can introduce you to another two more of their friends and you keep developing your network. And I think learning from medical device commercialization course um, was critical as well, because uh, it was the first time that I was exposing myself to business language and commercialization language. I was a quality engineer for two years, but I never taught as a, um, like, you know, someone who wants to have the responsibility of the whole thing uh, before I took those commercialization course that was like a, an intense course for a few months, for five, six months. Uh, so I think it's important to take the trainings talk to customers talk, uh, in medical device. I can say talk to surgeons, talk to surgeons, and also talk to people who have done it before. Uh, one of the things that I mentioned about being in the US is just it's uh, because of the population and also they have started way before us. It's just uh, older history. It's easier to find uh, the people who have done it before. And that's just uh, we have been lucky that that has become a bit easier for us. Mm. It's interesting um, that you're saying, I think uh, all three of you are saying actually industry and research are not two very distant planets. Um, and Maya, you're still very involved in research. Um, Tony, you, you're doing both, um, of course. So, you know, you, but it's a question of learning how to do both rather than switching um, from one to the other for, for, forever. Honestly, my opinion, uh, I mean, so far based on my experience is that a startup in deep tech, like if you have a really deep technology, not not just something that needs marketing. Like, for example, I don't know if you have have an app, maybe it has technical uh, 
uh, aspects, but it has a lot of marketing aspects. But in deep tech, uh, in life science and medical devices, it's a long journey. And I would say the first few years is actually research, but just different type of research. It's research and development, it's research with quality control and with different mindset. But it's we are I, we shouldn't be afraid to say that it's it's again research uh, uh, until you get your regulatory approval until you are be able you will pivot you will change your technical uh, formulation design so it's it's definitely research and development going on it's just uh, it's in a quality system management system and it's also with a different mindset um, reporting is different, timeline, deadlines, everything is different, but it's research. I actually find that um, that I do more experiments and, and research every single week. We are doing experiments and getting results and adapting and moving forward. Now, I, I do way more research, like actual experimental research, because in as an ecologist, we did um, observational type studies and they're long term and what have you. And now I do weekly experiments every week we learn this we learn this we adapt we try it we test it we, we you know and so it's it's just continuously like that and i've been really um amazed at how similar the skills are we're still applying for grants we're still doing all these other things to give us a runway so that we can uh, get our product more established across the the different markets etc so um i think a lot of the skills that academics have are are perfect for for a startup as well and I, I didn't realize how much overlap there was and I remember going to a, a, a women's leadership conference once and and they said oh you know who's who's ever done a pitch and I'm like oh no I don't even know what that means um, and then they said oh well it's just if you have an idea and you get other people on board I'm like, oh well, I do that all the time like all of my research is highly collaborative um, and so I'm like oh well yeah I you know, that's all I do. That's all I've ever done as a researcher is pitch my ideas to people and then try and get some funding to, to make it happen. And I feel like a business is much the same, um, except that it's very targeted and, and needs to address a need that people are, are will, you know, they have such a need that they're willing to pay for that solution. Great. Natasha, can I ask you, how crazy are the founders that you see and why do we make <laughs> startups so scary? I think we did that scary. So, I mean, look, every founder has to be a bit scary because it's a lonely, long path, whether you're in deep tech or not. Um, and you have to want to do it more than almost anything else. So sometimes people call it a calling. I am um, other people call it an affliction. <laughs> but it's, you know, it's something that you just have to be, you know, want to do uh, more than anything else. So every founder has to have a bit of craziness in them. Um, otherwise, we probably wouldn't invest in them. You know, we want to know that they've gone through a bit of pain so far that they've sacrificed something, that they've got the medal for for the journey. Um, because it is it is really hard, and um, you know, and and people have to be constantly learning. Um, if they're not, it's a pretty bad sign for an investor early on. Um, so uh <laughs> what was the second part of your question again Rom? so yes that everyone's crazy and that's a good thing what's the next <laughs> why do we make um startups so scary why 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 would people be why would people not, not even try to create a business i i think it's the risk it's the personal risk of not earning an income for a while um and if people are going into it expecting that investors will give them a lot of money to, you know, put their wage or the corporate wage or their research wage, that's really not going to happen. Um, so there is a personal risk in that, that you do have to give up a lot. But at the same time, the prize, which I believe is actually more than the journey than the economic return at the end, um, is worth so much more. Um, so it, it is scary, but once you take that leap of faith, like you really have to back yourself and, you know, and jump off a cliff, um, you know. To, <laughs> uh, I mean, I've got a profile which is jump and the net will catch me. Like that's that's that was my psychological profile for a, a big organisation <laughs> I worked for. And, um, and they said, oh, my God, you've got an entrepreneurial profile. We never usually hire people like you. <laughs> and actually it was a good thing because I, you know, I think really differently. So what, when you've made that jump, actually it all gets easier from then. And there's always a white noise of money in the background. 
But I do believe that, you know, if you've got the gumption and you've got, you know, and you've got the tenacity, you'll make something happen. Um, it, it's just a matter of time. Um, but of course, you have to always listen for the market signals too, um, to understand whether you're really solving a problem. So entrepreneurship is always that balance between am I crazy or am I really solving a proper customer problem? And, and you're always weighing those things up as, as you go along. Tony, can I ask you, what were the milestones or the sort of the, the rewards? I think just to share, you know, what um, the successes that, that you've had um, with, with the listeners might make them think, oh yeah, that's, you know, that, that, that's worth taking risks. Yeah, uh, thanks. So the, uh, the uh, first milestone I think is the journey itself, um, which sounds odd because it's not really something aiming at, it's rather something that mm -hmm. you're really uh, going through. Um, I would certainly endorse the theme park analogy here today, um, whether you're jumping into a net or in our case, it was riding a rather steep roller coaster. Um, you know, you've got to have a kind of mindset where you enjoy going to that theme park, right? And um, it's uh, it's a ride that can take you quite a long, long time. So you really have to enjoy that kind of journey. Um, from a very specific milestone perspective, uh, I too, recognize that although everyone talks about the financial and so forth, that was not really the major driver. It's certainly a very nice thing to have, but it's um, but it's not the major driver. It's I think one of the milestones is is really doing something that makes a big difference. It's incredibly rewarding while you while you're still in the middle of doing it all, but also at the at the later stages of it to really feel like you're having an impact. I think along the way, another milestone is really doing great science. If you continue to hit those major scientific milestones, they form the basis of really outstanding company behavior because there are too many variables as it is that you can't always control, but you can control how great the foundations are of what you do. Um, another milestone um, I think is um, is generating and to generate a network of people you know this is a long lasting network um you know don't see the barriers see the connections i think that's really powerful there too and at the risk of adding one last one over here um another milestone is that which a given extends uh, not through but also beyond and that is the ripples and pond you know we want to see other people do the same thing people uh, who uh, those of you who are out there listening to this today who really truly believe that uh, you've got the ability people aren't listening to you but you know it's right um i really think you should go for it and you've got a lot of expertise around the panel and beyond gather your people around you and use that to really hit that beyond milestone which is uh, influencing others around you share the vision so that you too can actually then drive things further forward so it's people milestones and things um, Rupal, I have a question for you. Is it ever too early to come and get support from a co-working space or other programs at university? Yeah, I mean, we try to, we're, we're still in relatively early days. So we're about a year into um, the opening of the Sydney Knowledge Hub. And so we're still, you know, figuring it out as I'm learning kind of what the needs are from researchers at the university. Um, Maybe I, what, I was thinking from the, I was thinking from the startup or from the founder's point of view, can they come and, and yeah. get your help too early? Yeah, and I, I think that what we are trying to do for founders of various maturities is to provide kind of ins. So um, you know, things like this is kind of an in. Um, you know, even if even if it's not technically within the Sydney Knowledge Hub's ecosystem. We kind of want to provide ins and inspirations throughout. So early on, you know, we want to provide more opportunities for networking events. So the more instances that researchers are um, running into the outside world, the more inspired they're going to be, the more they're going to understand the problem a little bit better. Um, and then, you know, as you're kind of creating your startup, there's, there's more, um, you might uh, spend a little bit of time on campus and kind of just kind of doing your day to day as you're understanding the problem a little bit more. Once you're kind of at a point where you're committed to the business, that's when you would probably come into the co-working space and, you know, have your kind of day to day being um, out of the summer of like a Sydney Knowledge Hub or something separate campus you're on. Because that's where really the, the peer to peer learning opportunities are um, come in, in handy. 
Um, it's really hard to find a network of support. You, you know, um, researchers tend to be folks that um, are lifelong learners and really love learning. And you know, you're never going to learn more than when you're doing a startup. Uh, more of a diversity of things that you just never. And and really, that peer-to-peer -peer learning um, is 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 quite important. Um, so I guess you know, and, and in terms of the people that are in the members that are in here right now, you know, we have very early stage businesses from the university ecosystem where they're just kind of here and learning the ropes and you know um, love to be part of the community all the way to kind of the larger organization. We have individuals from you know individual scientists from the larger organization. So what I'd say is if you are early in your journey, make sure that you are putting yourself in a position where you are getting exposed to um, um, the outside world or to people like Tony, you know, people like the academics that are, are all of you here. I just say Tony because he's at the University of Sydney. The academic, there's probably a handful, a, a dozen academics that tend to um, outweigh the rest in terms of invention disclosures and so forth. And so follow those folks, follow their social media, follow the events that they're going to, that they're speaking on. Um, and that's how you'll get pulled along for the journey. I, I agree. I think it's very powerful and very important to tell good stories and to share these good stories to actually say, you know, actually, it was a bit crazy. Uh, but it's not that hard and it's really worth it. Um, Natasha, can I ask you the same question? Uh, is it ever too early to come and, and share an idea with you? No, not really. Um, we love to talk to people early on. Um, I think the main thing is that you've got to understand that we are speaking slightly different languages. And although my ear is quite attuned to researchers, not mostly investors aren't. Um, and, you know, it goes back to what everyone here has been talking about is that I, I need to actually hear you're solving a customer problem. And it's not an imagined one, but you've actually gone and spoken to potential customers. And like Miriam said, it's incredibly painful. It's even incredibly painful for an extrovert like me to put myself out there and talk to people who might reject me. But that is just actually what the game is. Um, and so I, I want to get across things early. I want to help shape your journey if I can. I want to see your development because that gives me all very good clues as to how you're going to be on, on the journey later on. And share your ideas with others. Share your ideas with peers. Like ideas are pretty worthless. I mean, obviously, we've got an IP protection issue for a lot of deep tech. So you don't want to share anything too deep. But you can actually share the surface and get feedback on it and yeah lots of people are going to tell you your baby is ugly but you've got to keep yourself honest because you are wasting your own time and money while you go through this pro process and you're not actually you know um drawing any income so you you know the more incubators accelerators you can do you know Sydney Uni has incubate new south wales has founders you know i know deb went through Cyro's on anything to keep you honest to yourself, including a peer group around you who are going through what you're going through at the same time, is really helpful. Um, Debbie, can I ask you a, a quick question? Um, and I'll give you only two minutes to answer if that's okay. When you do experiments, do you know, is it easy for you to determine that these experiments or the results of the experiments will be used for your research or for your startup? Um, so my my academic work is is more about on ground conservation project. So they're actually quite separate. So my research now is like, you know, is the magnetometer performing under different temperature conditions today? <laughs> like that's that's the kind of experiment I'm doing now um, with my tech team, rather that and and so we then know that it will operate when somebody takes it out and tries to track that animal. Um, so we're looking at performance, we're looking at optimization of hardware, um, that type of thing when we're doing our experiments every week. Mm -hmm. And we also do um, different uh, quality assurance testing as well. So that's where all my experimentation now lies rather than tracking the animals themselves. But by doing that, I'm empowering others to do get really good data when they're out there doing research. Great. Um, Tony, quick question for you. Is there uh, more pressure for you to create the next data station? Uh, uh, yes, there is. Uh, and at the same time, also, um, there's a strong sense to still keep the science and research going too. So uh, mm -hmm. I'm still doing the same juggling process we've been talking about today. Um, I, 
I am very comfortable uh, knowing much more now than I knew beforehand. Um, so uh, what I what I do feel is that the next elastogen uh, would be a uh, a different type of experience, different type of journey, but still full of surprises and I guess buying another ticket to that theme park. Um, very comfortable with that. We've gone through the process of filing for some new patents now, and I think that uh, they can form the basis for it. Also, funny how um, you know when you've earned the stripes on the shoulder, um, so to speak, uh, people can see on a personal basis that somehow things have succeeded with you. Uh, they're much more comfortable having a conversation with you about future activities as well. So it's always always about the people, and they're trying to uh, make life a little bit easier for the next stages. So yeah, enjoy the journey, and if you do, then uh, you're so addicted you want to do it all over again. <laughs> mm. um, that, that's that's a good point, and maybe um, I, I'll ask Mariam very quickly again. How long is the journey? Is it you know uh, uh, is patience uh, an important skill? How is how long how long are you in in there for? You mean the journey of commercialization or the life yes. cycle of the products? I didn't get the question. The, the journey, how long do you think it really take you from, from the research to oh. um, seeing <laughs> patients utilizing your products? Okay, so uh, for us, we have a platform, but obviously we are not commercializing a platform. We are commercializing a specific intention for users. And our first product, uh, we actually hope that we can get our first regulatory approval. Uh, if, I, if we can get all the helps that we are hoping to get by the end of 2021. Uh, so that, but then that's just the first product will come with instrumentation. So then uh, I think the whole journey, I, I, I wouldn't put an end date on it, but it's just, uh, we have a, yeah, we have a platform and it's a different strategy when you have a platform. So we are going product by product. So one product is like uh, all experiments are for regulatory purpose, market purpose, and the other products are like research development, uh, optimization, like design developments. So uh, one of the crazy things is that there is no end. You don't know, like you get, um, hopefully you can exit or you can get public. And there is a chance that uh, also things may get wrong because of the things that are actually out of your control. Um, those things can happen. So I try not to think about the end. And as uh, everyone else said, it's, I think everyone who comes to science world uh, is crazy enough, to entrepreneurship world is crazy enough. And one of the craziness is that you don't put an end on it. And uh, as they said, you just buy each uh, runway. <laughs> so you just uh, plan for. So we have like 10 years financial modeling, but everyone knows that the first three years is real and the, the rest is just estimates and projects. We, and after that it's more uh, estimation projection and let's see who else we can bring on board which collaborations or right so that, that's a great way to end i think we've got a, a little bit less than a minute so i think what i'm what i'm taking away is that you have to buy a ticket for that ride go in the queue and enjoy the ride itself uh it's going to be a fun a fun ride i'm very glad we could share um, good crazy stories here uh, I think you've also found that um, there is support out there. Um, so don't hesitate to go and reach out to uh, Ropon, Natasha, Tony, Debbie and Mariam. Um, ask them to share their experiences, to, see, to, to tell you how and, and, and when they can help you. And I've got 20 more seconds to, 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 thanks every to thank everyone, uh, all the panelists, to thank everyone who was on the call today. And don't switch off completely. Um, you, there is, uh, Funder stories are continuing uh, at 1 and 1.30. So stay tuned. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.